Hi, I'm Evan B. Howard, and today I'm bringing you a video lecture straight from Egypt on early Egyptian monasticism. In another video, I cover the theme of retreat or withdrawal, and in that lecture, I briefly mention different expressions of monastic life associated with early Egyptian monasticism. Although my main point in that lecture is to clarify the meaning of getting away. You could say that this lecture is really my lecture on the Desert Fathers. But there are a couple of problems with that phrase. First, as I mentioned in my video on withdrawal, early Egyptian monasticism developed not simply out of a movement of withdrawal to the desert. The very first early Christian Egyptian monks were not hermits in the desert. They were village holy men. They were saints from which Antony, labeled the father of early monasticism, learned prior to removing deep into the desert. Indeed, one of the primary forms of monastic life, the communal or the Pacomian form, developed as people moved um, from desert areas closer to the Nile and the neighboring villages. I think that William Harmless is correct regarding this clarification when he writes, quote, usually Pacomius is spoken of in the same breath with Anthony and numbered among the desert fathers. This ignores the obvious. Pacomius and his disciples did not live in the desert. They lived near the Nile. They did not make the desert a city. They turned desolated villages into thriving communities. So now, the second problem then with summarizing the early Egyptian monasticism under the phrase desert fathers is that there were actually a number of mothers present from the very start. Again, when we read the story of Antony carefully, we learn that when he consecrated himself to the religious life, he left his sister in the care of a number of, quote, known and faithful virgins. The sayings of the desert fathers include actually the sayings of a number of women as well. I will cover the subject of women and virgins in my lecture on the origins of monasticism. For now, it is enough to realize that early Egyptian monasticism is not simply a matter of the desert fathers. Now, that said, what I want to do in this lecture is to present more of a historical overview of three of the most well-known monastic expressions as this movement developed in Egypt, particularly in the fourth century. Antony and the Anchoritic form, Pacomius and the Cenobitic form of life, and then the in-between form that, uh, that we call a skeet or a lora or lavra. And then after giving you an overview of those three forms, what I will do is also offer a couple of words about the three treasures of Egypt that we can appreciate as a result of this movement in monastic history. Our first form of early Egyptian monasticism that I'm going to cover is what is known as the Anchoritic form of monasticism. That comes from the Greek word anachoresis. And anachoresis essentially means getting away or withdrawing. And what we're talking about, in its essence, is a monastic lifestyle that is um, hermits. It's, it's people who are alone pursuing God. The story about the, that's most popular regarding the origins of the Anchoritic tradition in early Egyptian monasticism. Of course there were people who got away, but the person who really symbolized getting away and really getting away is a person by the name of Saint Antony. He had heard a call at a church, um, sell all you have and come follow me, and so he did. And he moved away um, and pursued God a little ways from the village, and then he moved to some tombs, and then he moved to the fortress, and, and, and he ministered to people, and went further and further and further he got away, until by the end of his life, he uh, found a way to live uh, in a cave. In fact, this very cave where I am standing, 
And he lived in this cave, sitting down and, and uh, weaving mats, standing up and praying, sitting down and weaving mats, standing up and praying, walking long distances to get water, coming back. And this is the way he lived. It's a simple routine. There's a lot of time spent getting to know yourself, getting to know the demons in your own life. And indeed, the life of Antony, published by a gentleman by the name of Athanasius, tells not only about Antony's withdrawal into the desert alone, but also tells about how he fought with his own demons. Ultimately, people came and joined him and, and stayed in caves here and there, not too close, but not too far. And ultimately, he formed a whole uh, bunch of people. He, he discipled them, and the Anchoritic tradition, the, the way of being a monk by living alone out in desert caves, uh, became something a tra of a tradition. Uh, even Anth Athanasius says he made the desert a city. So, um, and, and as a matter of fact, by the time Antony died, um, this place, there was enough people, they remembered. A full monastery was formed uh, very close to this cave, and a monastery that uh, lives, a uh, monastic community that lives to this day. Uh, Antony, when he, he lived here, would periodically visit. He would go in to Alexandria or closer, and he would visit other monks and offer spiritual direction. Uh, he would try, con try and argue against heretics, and people would bring him food periodically. He had no special rule of life. He just followed the Holy Spirit and, and the work that God needed to do in his own life, and then through his own life to others. And this was the work of God, the harsh work of living in a cave, surviving and confronting your own demons and following the, the ministry of God in your own life. And that is the work, the, the form of Anchoritic monasticism. Unfortunately, I cannot show you the remains of Pacomius monasteries in Upper Egypt, closer to the source of the Nile. There's nothing left of them today. And the Pacomian, or the large communal form of monastic life, has essentially disappeared from Egypt. You can still visit the remains of St. Shenouda's famous white monastery in the early 5th century, the home of hundreds of monks, um, which is an equally large co convent nearby. And you can get the size of this community from this image here I'm showing, though I must confess that I have never visited. It's just too much to get there from here. What is important, however, is to understand the distinctions between the Anchoritic and the Cenobitic forms of monastic life. I think this might be done best if we look at a chart comparing some of the basic features of these two forms of monastic life. In the Anchoritic form of life, there's a relatively small group of people um, concerned. In the Cenobitic life, there is a relatively large group of people. In the Anchoritic life, you have no complex command structure. Whereas in the Cenobitic life, you have a more complex, almost pyramidical command structure for the entire institution. And whereas in the Anchoritic life, you have no formal titles or job definitions generally. In the Cenobitic life, you usually have administrative titles, appointments, job definitions, things like that. In the Anchoritic life, it's based largely more on a master-disciple relationship. Whereas in the Cenobitic life, what you have is this formal distinction of ranks, and sometimes in a pretty fairly extensive hierarchy. In the Anchoritic life, you'll have largely a self-regulating private practice of prayer 
in a Cenobitic life, there's much stronger sense of a communal hours of prayer, what we know in the West as the divine office. In the Anchoritic life, um, what you will find is a personal spiritual mentoring of disciples by a master hermit. And in the Cenobitic life, particularly around Pacomius, you have a, a, the personal spiritual mentoring is at the level of a house leader or in small groups, things like that. Uh, in the Anchoritic um, life style, um, you usually it's, it's arranged by uh, single hermitages. Um, simple. Uh, in the Cenobitic life, um, usually you'll have an elaborate and, and rationally planned physical plant, um, large-scale residence houses, uh, things like that. Um, in the Anchoritic, uh, the house is usually uh, a master hermit, is uh, self-regulating, uh, the disciples uh, following the instructions of the master. Um, whereas in the Cenobitic, there's actually job assignments that are issued by superiors and things like that. In the Anchoritic life, the master scrutinizes his own disciples and scrutinizes himself. Um, in the Cenobitic life, um, there's surveillance of all residents by superiors, which is involved in this chain of command. And ultimately, your um, submission is more to a rule than to a person. We'll get into that later. In um, the uh, Anchoritic lifestyle, there's really not a large uh, amount of organized schedule, whereas in a Cenobitic lifestyle, um, you'll have a more carefully organized, regulated schedule for all, because you've got more people. Um, in Anchoritic, um, the rule of life, uh, what we call a rule of life, is really transmitted orally, and it's by example, whereas in a Cenobitic form of life, um, you have a, an actual written monastic rule, which is either a piece of paper, a book, something like that. Um, in an Anchoritic situation, you will have a more charismatic style of leadership, whereas in the Cenobitic, as we kind of hinted already before, it's a more bureaucratic thing. Um, in the Anchoritic, uh, predominantly male hermits. Um, every once in a while you hear stories about women who dress up as men and they uh, go out and become hermits and live the lifestyle. Um, but it, largely it's, it's male hermits. Um, whereas in the Cenobitic lifestyle you have uh, nunneries as well as um, monasteries for men. And then, um, yeah, that's about it um, for the basic structure. Now in the 4th and 5th centuries, um, this was the largest of the three forms of monastic life in early Egypt, with male and female monasteries scattered throughout Egypt, some of them numbering in the thousands of members. But as I mentioned, little of this remains today, though I actually have to learn at some point in time the connections, if there is any, between the early women's communities and the active women's convents um, that are alive in Egyptian cities today. This then brings me to the third and final form of Egyptian monastic life, the skeet. As I mentioned, the skeet is an in-between form of life, falling somewhere in between the hermitage and the commune. What you have in a skeet is a collection of single hermitages and with where one monk, perhaps a monk and some disciples, will live in each of these hermitages. The basic form of monastic life would be that of the anchorite. Little organized structure, dependent on the relationship between the spiritual father and the disciple, and so on. And yet, there was also a greater community connection. All the monks living within a certain area would gather each week at some common location to celebrate communion, to eat together, and to share life a bit. There were a few decisions to be made that affected the entire group. Thus, while a skeet was largely a collection of hermits, there was still a corporate dimension to their life. Now, the most well-known location for this form of life was in Lower Egypt, in the deserts that were located near the mouth of the Nile. And that is where I am located right now. <laughs> 
at the monastery of St. Macarius in Wadi El Natrun. Now, due to centuries of persecution, the monks were here forced to bring their private cells together, indeed, next to each other. Fortresses were built to protect the monastic community from utter destruction. Plagues and politics had their toll on the Egyptian monasteries, and yet the community survived, although with a few changes. The development of early Egyptian monasticism was a powerful movement in the 4th and 5th centuries, and has survived to this day, even in spite of the many hardships. Currently, the monks at this monastery dwell in private apartments, and they eat one meal per day in common. Most of the monks gather together for three times for daily prayers, a total of perhaps maybe four or five hours of common prayer. They manage a common farm. There is a bit more structure to life here, although they have no such thing as a written rule of life. That fact that Coptic monasticism never makes use of a written rule of life is one of the most compelling aspects of monastic life here. The relationship with the spiritual father is so important and so well managed that it simply takes the place of a rule. So, as you can see, the three forms of early Egyptian monasticism, the hermitage, the community, and the skeet have ultimately been blended together in current Coptic monastic practice. Having reviewed the forms of life in early Egyptian monasticism, it now remains for me to say something about the treasures of Egypt. And treasures there are, at least for the students of Christian spiritual life. To me, these treasures come in two, ah, maybe three forms. The literature of the period, the spiritual virtues that have been considered in this literature through the movement. And then, now that I've actually been here, there is a third, the living witness of Coptic Christian monasticism itself. First, there is really a wealth of information, a wealth of literature surrounding the development of the monastic history in the fourth century of Egypt. Most people start with the biographies. There's the lives of, of Antony, Pacomius, and others. And then uh, after that then come the sayings, these collections of wise words that a lot of the different monks in a lot of different locations have had to say. Um, these people were highly regarded, and so they, their sayings were collected and then formed into single volumes of those collections. But Egyptian Christianity produced more than just lives and sayings. Uh, for example, we have letters written by uh, Antony himself, for example. Uh, we have records of the rules of life of the Pacomian communities. We possess travel logs, these records of people who went on, on tours, you know, like, kind of like spiritual tourists or pilgrims who were visiting monasteries, they had heard of the reputation of the monasteries in Egypt and came down and took a tour of them, much as maybe I'm doing right now. Um, and then we've got devotional and theological collections from people like Evagrius of Pontus or John Cashin. There really is a lot of wonderful mining to be done in the literature of the riches of early monastic literature. And then um, when we mine this literature, then, even just a little bit, what you find underneath this is a second and a deeper treasure uh, in Egypt. This, the characteristic spiritual virtues that have been emphasized through this movement and can be really valuable as we appropriate them today. Um, I'll just name a few here. First of all, the value of withdrawal. Uh, the value of withdrawal from ordinary spiritual life. I'll have a separate lecture on that and I talk about the distinction between withdrawal simply from geography and withdrawal from um, social life or ordinary social life. From human interaction, from common responsibilities, from worldly uh, influences, 
Uh, the desert uh, tradition, uh, as we call a desert tradition, early Egyptian monasticism teaches us about withdrawal. Self-denial, uh, ascetical practice. This is where you learn a lot about fastings or vigils or staying up night watching or uh, self-examinations, the denial of even spiritual goods, thinking of yourself as being spiritually valuable. Uh, these uh, all kinds of these ascetical practices are discuss discussed at great length in this early fourth century Egyptian monastic material. And there's a lot of good stuff to find out about that value. Another value that they modeled and taught, uh, there's the negative side in some ways, uh, you look at ascetical values as being a little bit negative. There's also another positive side of monasticism, which is the, um, the pursuit of virtue. The development of the different virtues, holiness and love and compassion and trust and things like that. Um, the early monastic literature pays careful attention to the development of vices and virtues. Prayer, of course prayer. Psalmody, the, the staying up and the reciting of psalms and the identifying ourselves with the psalms through prayer or liturgical prayers, lots of liturgical prayers. And, and then the calling out, the crying out um, to Christ um, when we are in danger, when we're uh, suffering from uh, temptation or things like that. And then there's the contemplative prayer. Uh, Evagrius has a whole theology of contemplative prayer and others, uh, John Cashin and others as well, where we can learn rich things about contemplative prayer through this early fourth century tradition. Another theme that comes up in the early Egyptian monastic literature is the theme of warfare or conflict. Uh, it comes up in a number of different areas, a conflict with demons, uh, there's a lot of discussion of demonology. The life of Antony itself is almost a manual of doing battle with the devil. Evagrius of Pontus is um, talking back, where he talks about how you fight the logoi, the thoughts that come from the devil, and just all kinds of things like that, of dealing with vices, uh, lifestyle in the social environment itself. Um, you'll find a lot of uh, good discussion about uh, fighting conflict, warfare, um, spiritual warfare in the early Egyptian literature. Another theme that you have in this uh, literature and a treasure from Egypt is a theme of accountability. I mentioned to you that the rule of life uh, is largely unwritten and, and that the relationship with the spiritual father or mother um, takes the place of that. Well, um, that shows there's a rich heritage in understanding an accountable relationship and where you allow one to guide you forward in the Christian life. Uh, there's accountability to God's spirit that's strong in this literature, accountability to scripture, and then to the word or the giver of the word through the relationship with the spiritual father or the abbot or abbess. And, you know, under the term, we often will use the term obedience, but it's much richer than that idea. Finally, another word I want to bring out, it's odd to talk about this even in small groups or, um, or anchorites, or hermits, but yet accountability, or not accountability, I just mentioned that, um, hospitality is another big theme in the Egyptian desert literature. Um, appropriate welcome to visitors, and not only welcome in terms of food and bringing them and enabling them to sleep in the midst of your poverty, whatever it might be, but there is this non-judgmentalism that is a form of hospitality, a welcoming, a non-judging the person for who they are. So these are some important and wonderful themes that you can get out of the early Egyptian literature. Withdrawal, self-denial, virtue, prayer, warfare, accountability, hospitality. Now some of these, I've already produced video lectures on many of those themes, and I will probably produce a few more on the other themes. Um, but you can see how a lot of the very, very important themes of Christian monasticisms, old and new, uh, have roots in this early Egyptian uh, tradition of monasticism. So um, then uh, there is the third treasure, the living community of Coptic monasticism. I have gotten to know some wonderful, wonderful people here. And, and even when you ask them, 
Like, what does Coptic Christianity have to say to the rest of the world? You know, just one phrase, just one short paragraph, and you can hear the riches of that. What would you like to tell my students about Coptic Christianity? Uh, they don't know anything. Americans don't know anything. Uh, and about Coptic monasticism. If you had anything you could tell them, what would you tell them? I would say that, that uh, as long as God is love, and we all children, children of God, mm -hmm. we must become children of love. Mm -hmm. So there you have it, a brief introduction to the three forms and three treasures of early Egyptian monasticism. My hope is, first, that you will find some room in your life, later date maybe to explore this movement further. You will be the better for it. And then second, as always, my hope is that through this exploration and through God's grace, you will come more and more to experience all things new.